Today on Primary Care, the crisis of black males in medicine and what it means to the health of the nation. Those who go to medical school are only going to be those who come from families who can afford to send their kids to medical school and then we're gonna have a very disparate situation. Hello, I'm Dr. Lonnie Joe, and welcome to Primary Care. The number of black males going to medical school in this country is on the decline and has been over the last three decades. According to a recent report by the AAMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges, in 1978, there were 542 black males enrolled in medical school. And in 2014, 36 years later, that number fell to 515. Here to help us understand the reason behind this decline is Dr. Emroy Wilson. Dr. Wilson is the president of Wayne State University here in Detroit, Michigan. His perspective on declining number of African-American males in medicine is cited throughout the AAMC report. Dr. Wilson, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Tell us a little bit more about this landmark study that looked at African-American males in medicine matriculation trends. This is something that I think a lot of people in our healthcare community didn't know and the public certainly didn't know. Well, certainly, as you said, it's been a trend for a couple of decades now, but it's really reached an alarming crisis stage right now. And that's why I think that this WMC report is very timely. It focuses our attention on this, what I would consider to be a national crisis at this time. The number of black males going to college is up, but the number of males getting admitted to medical school is down seems to be a roadblock, a bottleneck, or some kind of issue there with people matriculating at this point. Yeah, you, you're right. The number of people going to college in general is going up, and certainly um, same for African Americans. But you've got to dig a little bit deeper. You know, what kind of schools, what kind of colleges are they going to? For example, the proportion of African American males who go to community colleges and get an associate degree is about 7%. That's about the same as a proportion of males in general that get an associate degree. But then when you start talking about those who go into four-year colleges, you know, take out the for-profit universities, because that's another, that's another issue, but the four-year colleges, then that disparity really grows in terms of African-American men and men in general in the uh, college age population. And so, and then when you talk about the selective schools, that disparity is even greater. And obviously, as you know, being a physician, it's, it's hard getting into med school. You know, it's gonna be very hard getting into med school coming from a for-profit university or certainly from a, a community college, you know, it's almost impossible. So the type of school that African-American men are going into is, is also important. And we've got to delve a little bit deeper into that data. So the, the background in terms of educa education and the quality of education is very important. Oh, absolutely. And you know, when you look at the reasons why African-American males in, in general uh, are not progressing uh, to get to the stage where they can apply to medical school and be accepted, it's complex. You know, certainly there are issues such as the preparation in high school and, and in elementary school. When you look at the Detroit school system, I mean, that tells you something there. I mean, it's just, they're just not preparing college-age kids uh, in adequate numbers. Uh, financial situation is, is also a factor. Uh, it's very well known that if you come from a family in the top quartile of income, that the chances of graduating from college is exponentially higher than if you come from a family of, um, in the bottom quartile. And what's, uh, what's disturbing is that that trend is actually, that disparity is, is growing between those in the top um, income quartile and those in the bottom income quartile so that the, um, the numbers of African Americans and other minorities from lower socioeconomic backgrounds that are getting degrees is not much different than 30 years ago, whereas 
those in the top quartile um, in general has, uh, has increased from about 40 percent 30 years ago to close to 90 percent now. But when you look at it though, you know, one might say, well, that applies to African American women also. You know, the, the financial situation, preparation in, in high school and, and so forth. So why is it that African American men are doing so poorly, whereas African American women are actually doing better? And I think the answer there lies to how we um, perceive African American men, the stereotyping, the public image, the stereotyping of African American men. You know, we, they, um, you know, we have this image of them as being thugs and, and uh, more, this, this myth that there's more African American men in prison than there is in college. And, you know, those kinds of, of stereotypes that's been per per unfortunately perpetuated uh, over and over again um, is, is a major problem, I think. Do you think that the stereotyping is beginning to have not only effect of the people who portray it on African American men, but on African American men themselves? Is it, a, is it affecting their self-esteem in terms of what they actually can feel? Do they feel that the system is so far and rigged against them that they're believing that stereotype themselves? Oh, I think so. I, I think that's really one of the major issues here is that when, you know, when people are treating, you a, are treating you a certain way over and over and over again, and you get these messages that, that you don't belong and that you belong somewhere else, you start internalizing that, and I'm sure that that's a factor. Talk a little bit about the cost. Astronomical nowadays compared to when we were going to school uh, and, and role models. I mean, two things that really need to go together in terms of changing the perception about yourself and what you actually can achieve as an African-American male in this industry. Yeah. Well, let, let's do the role models first. I, I think that's very important. And African-American males need more role models, very, very uh, frankly. Um, the number of mentors available for African-American males is, is small. And mentorship is, uh, is a very important component of being success, not only in college, but through uh, medical school also. In terms of the cost, it has been going up. Uh, uh, sources of um, scholarship and other forms of financial aid has uh, not kept up with the cost of getting a medical degree. I fear, this is one of my, my major concerns, is that unless we do something about that, that we're gonna have a situation where those who go to medical school are only going to be those who come from families who can afford to send their kids to medical school, and then we're gonna have a very disparate situation. Dr. Wilson, we're gonna take a break, and when we return, we'll talk to you about the town hall where the presidents of black medical schools join forces to discuss this crisis of black males in medicine. I grew up in the housing projects of Cleveland. I didn't even know that life could be any better than it was. Education for me has been a way to get away from the agony of what was normal life. I want to be able to impact the community, not just look back on where I came from, but to reach back to where I came from and pull some people up with me. My name is David, and I am your dividend. How can I help my daughter with her reading? Searching for help with Dachshund Reading. No. <laughs> Let me try. Sarah's bright, but when she's reading, she has trouble sounding out words. Playing world music. What? I give up. Wait, I was trying to show you how Sarah feels every day. Frustrating, isn't it? Redirecting to understood.org. Join parents and experts at understood.org, a free online resource about learning and attention issues to help your child thrive. Welcome back. At the 2015 National Medical Association Conference held here in Detroit, the presidents and deans from our nation's four historically black medical colleges came together to participate in a town hall meeting to discuss the landmark report, Altering the Course of Black Males in Medicine. I don't want us 
to just be dependent upon us. You all, we cannot do this alone. There are a thousand black students who apply to medical school every year who have MCAT scores in the 27 to 29 range who do not get into medical school. And so therefore, it is a requirement that our majority schools are stepping up. We could double the number almost of black men in the next two years if people would have a more holistic approach to their admissions process. So we got to push from that perspective. Dr. Hildred. I was gonna, I was gonna make the point that my colleague just made that even if all four of our schools doubled or even tripled the number of students we trained, that wouldn't move the dial very much. Until the majority schools step up to the plate and do their part, I mean, let's face it, most of the majority medical schools are located in urban settings with large numbers of minority students living in the neighborhoods. And quite frankly, if they would just do their part by reaching out to those communities in which they're situated, this could, be, this could change fairly quickly. But again, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little emotional here. Until black males, of whom I'm one, are not demonized, and assumptions are made about us for all the wrong reasons, this is not gonna change very much, okay? Let's just, I'm just, okay? <laughs> so it all comes back to the leadership in academic medicine, making a decision that this is important and that it's gonna change, okay? That's what this really comes down to because these four schools, we're doing our part. That's not the issue and we're gonna keep doing our part. What we have to do is to work with the majority schools to have them do their part. Dr. Wilson, you head up the largest medical school, single campus medical school in the country, Wayne State University School of Medicine. What is Wayne State doing now and what are the plans in the future to help address this, this longstanding problem? So let me say first of all that Wayne State Medical School has had a, a very proud history of having uh, a lot of diversity in its classes. In fact, when you take away the historically black medical schools, of the majority medical schools in the country, Wayne State was the most diverse at one time. This is about two or three decades ago. To be very frank with you, I think that over the past decade or so, we've dropped the ball. And our classes are not nearly as diverse as they used to be. I think part of the problem is that we we're not using holistic review admissions processes as well as some other things. We're reversing all of that. At this point right now, we've completely revamped our admissions process from last year to this year. We are using holistic review admissions. We are not using arbitrary cutoffs, but we're really getting people in and interviewing them and trying to find out more about them and seeing if they're the kind of people that we want to become our doctors or the future and making sure that we are looking at all the attributes of the applicants and not um, casting aside uh, applicants who will be possibly become extraordinarily good doctors but don't even have the chance to be looked at because of admissions processes that are uh, antiquated. Tell us about this holistic approach to the admissions process. Well, holistic approach looks at the entire individual, not just their grades and their MCAT scores, but all the experiences, attributes, you look at what you want your physician to be like, and then looks at the characteristics of the applicant and, and really takes in, taking into account the mission of the medical school so that you're not just relying on these um, sometimes arbitrary cutoffs of grades and MCAT scores. Very interesting, you, sh you should mention the broadening of the process. Um, as a person who interviews students from medical school, we, we run sort of uh, a Miss America contest. Um, you know, they're all beautiful, they're in beautiful nightgowns, they all have a talent, they all want world peace, and just pick one she's pretty, she'll represent well. Uh, I think that you're correct in that this broadening aspect uh, helps us view the person as an individual in a totally different manner than what we've been doing for years now. Uh, in actuality, probably bringing a detriment to the healthcare workforce of this country by not finding ways to be inclusive 
of those people who, as you said, would make excellent physicians and, and provide health care uh, for all types of populations. Well, absolutely. The, the uh, United States is becoming increasingly diverse. We need a uh, health workforce and a biomedical research workforce also that is also diverse. Uh, we can't afford to have uh, one segment of the, the population not have all of its talents uh, utilized. Society needs that talent. You, you, you were involved with another study regarding the holistic review admissions process. Tell us about this landmark study and how it affected the admissions uh, process. Yes, th this was a national study, and it looked not only at medical schools, but also all health professional schools. Some very interesting findings. First of all, there are critics of holistic review, and uh, most of these uh, criticisms center around whether um, you're lowering the standards. You know, if you don't use grades and, and cutoffs for uh, standardized tests, I, I'd be lowering the standards. What was interesting about this study is that of the schools who used holistic review compared to those who did not use holistic review, when you look at the outcomes, for example, their board passage rate, um, uh, their, their graduation rate, those kind of, of firm outcomes, those who used holistic review, the outcomes were at least as good, if not better, than those who did not use holistic review. And then other softer outcomes like community engagement and other uh, things like that, those who used holistic review actually had better outcomes than those schools who did not use holistic review. So I think the, the data is very clear that you don't lower your standards by using holistic review. You get a better class. And uh, people are beginning to realize that, and I think it's gaining much greater acceptance. In fact, I just came from the WMC meeting uh, this week in which I led a uh, session on holistic review. There were two sessions on holistic review, the one that I led and another one, and both sessions were uh, um, filled to capacity with a lot of interest from majority medical schools. Stay with us. When we return, we'll have more with Dr. M. Roy Wilson, President Wayne State University. Morning, Gary. We are GetSchooled.com. You want a college education, don't you? You know you do. Uh, yeah, but I don't know where to start. That's why we're here. We're free, handsome, oh, I think we're breathtaking. And here to guide you through every step of the way, starting with attendance. <laughs> Gary, financial aid forms. Biology homework, G. I got this. <coughs> Is that brand? <laughs> Colleges love extracurricular activities. Well, uh, chess really isn't my thing. I got this. Doesn't matter. Go ahead. Picking a college, man. You and us go together like tacos and Tuesday. And I love tacos. Fire and ice. Those don't really go together. Go to GetSchool.com for more info. You've messed up your son's haircut. Do you try to fix it? Work with what you've got. Or show solidarity. Thank you, baby. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. Welcome back. We're here with the president of Wayne State University, Dr. M. Roy Wilson, in the beautiful Integrative Biomedical Science Building just recently opened here on the Wayne State campus. Dr. Wilson, what would you say the role of Wayne State and other urban universities, uh, how do they see their role now in terms of research and minorities being involved in research, and particularly medical research. Well, you mentioned this building, and one of the things that uh, this building is going to be committed and dedicated to is doing research that directly impacts the community. We want our research to focus on challenges of urban health. We're going to attack problems such as obesity and other metabolic diseases, cardiovascular disease, um, and other diseases that are disproportionate in urban communities and try to attack them from different vantage points, whether it's strictly uh, from the medical standpoint, but also something as complex as obesity. You have social issues, you have psychological issues. There are different ways to attack it. And, and the, the vision of this building is to bring all those different perspectives together to tackle the major challenges of urban health. 
you just had an announcement uh, not too long ago in the newspaper that got a lot of attention in terms of a program that you're starting that's going to start with high school students in terms of identification and that will lead uh, them to uh, careers in healthcare professions. Tell us a little bit about that program. It's called MedDirect and we're very, very excited about it. So what we're going to do is we're going to take some very, very high performing high school students who are interested in pursuing medical careers, specifically though, interested in health disparities. We're going to admit them to both the undergraduate school and the medical school at the same time. We'll pay their way completely through their undergraduate school, tuition, full tuition, board, room, everything. Can I get in line and go back? For and then they go directly into the med school. Uh, they have to keep their grades up and so forth, but they'll go directly into the med school and we're going to completely pay their tuition for med school. This is going to be about a $250,000, $300,000 package for these kids. Now obviously, you know, this is expensive. We're putting a lot of investment in this and so there are some standards that we're going we're to have. Uh, first of all, the, uh, the kids are going to have to come from uh, lower socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, secondly, they, they, they're going to have to be interested in health disparities. And uh, thirdly, they're going to have to keep their grades up and do well, uh, at least a minimum score on the MCAT when uh, it's time to go to medical school. Uh, but we think that by, by doing this and admitting these kids early, uh, letting them focus on their studies and not whether or not they're going to get into medical school, that they'll branch out and take more courses that are uh, uh, broader in perspective, that they'll graduate um, having uh, a better education overall because they will have taken broader courses without worrying about whether or not they're going to get into med school or not, and just be more humanistic and be better physicians. So you've kind of taken some of the major hurdles out of the picture by looking at this as a total package program from start to finish. Th that's right, you know, medical school is so competitive, to get into medical school is so competitive that regardless of how good a student you were in high school, there's no guarantee that you're gonna get into medical school just because you were a good high, high school student. And, and during your college years, many medical students, they are, they're very anxious, you know, they're, they're competing against the, their fellow classmates to get the best grades, take the even more harder science courses and things like that. And you know, to be able to take that anxiousness out, that anxiety out, and let them focus on getting a good foundation in terms of education, both in the sciences and the humanities, I believe will make them become better doctors. And by focusing on the lower socioeconomic um, kids, I think we'll get a, a large percentage of those will obviously be minority, minority kids. And so uh, we, we think it's gonna, it's gonna be a, a great program. The, the, the other thing I should just mention is that, you know, we need more African-American physicians of all types, meaning those who go into primary care, those who go into specialty care, and those who go into biomedical research or become medical leaders. And um, I don't wanna to, uh, focus only on those who are going to go out to practice. That's a very important um, part of the training program. And we need more African Americans to be practicing physicians, no question about it. But we also need more biomedical researchers and leaders in medicine. And I want Wayne State to be able to be the place that you can go to as a young African American kid and know that if you want to, you can become a leader in medicine, you can become a biomedical researcher, or you can become a practitioner, whether it's in primary care or in one of the specialties. That's interesting because currently what we have, as you know, is a system that sort of directs people depending on what their performance looks like along a, a particular path. Uh, you may want to be an ER doctor, but you wind up being a psychiatrist because of what the availability is, uh, what test scores may or may not look like, what recommendations may or might not look like. But here, here it seems to be that you, you're developing a program where a student can say, I know that this is a goal that's attainable and not something that I'm forced into because of the, the, the system itself, for lack of a better term. 
and the outcomes that we currently deal with. I mean, if we're going to buy into the concept of outcomes-based medicine, we need to look at the current outcomes, which I don't think anybody's really that proud of. But it sounds like you have some minimum criteria for this program, too, for, for entry. Oh, absolutely. But, you know, we, we want to make sure, though, that we give the kids the, the tools that they need to be outstanding whether it's going to be in, in performing in med school or biomedical research. We need to provide them that kids. That means research experiences when they're undergraduate, shadowing exper experiences when they're undergraduate so that they shadow people like yourself, uh, outstanding physicians out there in the community who are doing things, and, and really getting that experience very early on to help prepare them for the rigors of a medical life. Yeah. Children can't be what they can't see. That's right. Good. We're here with Dr. Emroy Wilson, president of Wayne State University in this beautiful facility. Congratulations, Dr. Wilson, and uh, thank you for joining us on the show. It was certainly my pleasure. Excellent. If you would like a copy of the AAMC report, Altering the Course, Black Males in Medicine, visit our website, primarycare-tv.com. Thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Lonnie Joe, and we'll see you next time on Primary Care.